everyone, and welcome to our Internal Audit Insights. Today, we will be talking about TRID tolerance requirements and some of the issues that we see there. I'm Mignon Davis, and I'm joined by Cassidy Tim. Together, we run Internal Audit here at Richie May. All right, let's dig in. So why does TRID matter? TRID violations can incur fines of up to $5,000 per day for the first tier violations. And for second tier violations, the fines can be up to $25,000 per day. And the second tier is usually from lack of due care or recklessness. So it's very important to understand TRID. Now, TRID stemmed from the 0708 financial crisis, and it was implemented in 2015. It's a consolidation of the disclosures required by TILA and RESPA. There are timing requirements, but today we're going to focus on the content of the disclosures and some of the common issues that we see in the disclosures. Just to name a few of the issues that we typically see is clients understating third-party fees or overstating third-party fees, trying to you know overstate them to be conservative. Uh, sometimes we see that and they think that that's a good thing, but um, you know overstating or understating third-party fees is not good either in either direction. And basically what happens with those is it, it means that you're not meeting that good faith standard that is required when you are disclosing fees. Other issues that we see are fee names are not the same on the loan estimate and the closing disclosure, they're supposed to match. And then also miscategorizing when some fees are paid outside of closing, for example, the appraisal fee. If the borrower pays for the appraisal outside of closing and then it's miscategorized on the closing disclosure and, and indicated in the box there that it was paid at closing, so essentially charging the borrower twice for that item. So that's another issue that we see. There are also common errors that can lead to reimbursement scenarios. So there's three tolerance buckets, and those are the zero tolerance, a 10% tolerance, and then there's unlimited tolerance. So first, let's talk about the zero tolerance bucket. So no individual fee in the zero tolerance bucket can increase beyond what was disclosed on the loan estimate, unless there's a triggering event, such as a change circumstance that allows for a revised loan estimate. Lenders must ensure that the disclosed values for these fees are accurate. So usually most of these fees are located in sections A and B of the loan estimate. And some examples of these fees include things like origination charges and then lender required services that the borrower is not allowed to shop for, including you know things like appraisal fees, credit report fees, flood determination fees, and things like that. So the good faith standard comes into play under this zero tolerance bucket that we just described. And so what is good faith? What does that mean? The official interpretations discuss exercising due diligence to obtain information that's reasonably available at the time of the issuance of the loan estimate. There may be instances where the fee is allowed to change in this bucket, and that's where a valid change of circumstances comes in. So what is a valid change of circumstance? And this is an issue that we see with a lot of clients is they may do a change of circumstance on the loan, but it may not be valid. There are certain reasons, certain triggering events that will occur that cause a valid change of circumstances. So if it's a valid change, it could be something that affects the settlement charges, such as the borrower's credit score changes dramatically during the loan process, property appraisal issues, or a change in the loan amount or the loan program. Also, reinspection, if, if the appraisal comes in and a reinspection is required, that could be a valid change of circumstance. Also, the borrower may request certain changes. The borrower may request a, a different loan type or program, and that's going to change everything on the loan, right? So you're going to have to do a change of circumstance and then send out a new loan estimate. That could be, you know, changing from a conventional loan to an FHA loan or vice versa. There could be extraordinary events that happen, such as natural disasters, changes in tax laws, regulatory changes that affect the cost of the loan, perhaps. These could all be triggering events that would trigger a valid change in circumstance. There could also be information specific to the borrower or the transaction that could be newly discovered information about the borrower's financial situation or the property. 
the collateral being financed. Um, so new information can definitely trigger a valid change of circumstances. Now, some issues that we've seen with clients is that sometimes the change of circumstance is completed and it's not valid. So we need to really be careful. And some of the issues that we've seen, for example, a VA loan, borrower applies for a VA loan and the MLO sent out the loan estimate and did not include the VA funding fee. So they did a change of circumstance to add it back in. That's not valid. If it's, if it's the MLO's mistake on a loan estimate, that's not a reason to trigger a change of circumstance. So that is not valid. If you omit putting in your uh, fees, your VA funding fee or origination fees, then you can't charge the borrower for those. Another issue that we've seen is the MLO listed the property type incorrectly. So when they order the appraisal, they order the appraisal maybe for a single family residence and then realize later, oh, this is a condo and the appraisal is going to cost more. So we'll do a change of circumstance because the appraisal amount is listed in that zero tolerance bucket. It can't change, right? So they'll do a change of circumstance. But with today's technology, when the borrower gives you that address for that property, you should easily be able to look it up and identify the property type. Even if the borrower doesn't tell you it's a condo or a rural property, you should be able to identify that soon on in the process prior to ordering that appraisal to make sure that you're able to estimate correctly what that appraisal is going to cost. All right, so that's the zero tolerance bucket. Then there's also the 10% aggregate tolerance bucket, which encompasses third-party services for which the consumer was allowed to shop. If the consumer chooses a provider from the service provider list that your institution provided to them for fees that are typically located in Section C of the loan estimate and recording fees, then those fees are included in that 10% bucket. So the aggregate amount of the charges paid by or imposed on the consumer at consummation may not exceed that 10% for fees originally disclosed on the loan estimate. So some examples of these fees include title company services, including lender's title insurance, settlement fee, search and exam fee, uh, inspections, including pest, septic, and well water, survey, recording charges, including deed of trust or mortgage. Then there's also the unlimited tolerance bucket. So certain fees, such as the shop services for which the consumer chose a provider, other than those listed on the service provider list, non-lender required services, and the insur insurance premiums all can fall into the unlimited bucket as long as they meet that good faith standard. It's important to know what services the borrower shop for that were not included on your service provider list for it to fall within that unlimited tolerance bucket. If they were on the list, that you provided, then it would fall in that 10% tolerance bucket. So it's important to know what was on your list that you're giving them. Yeah, very important to know because if they chose something off of that provider list, it falls into one bucket. If they chose something on their own, then that falls in the other bucket. So really, that really determines which bucket it goes into. It's very important. And the other thing that we wanted to talk about was technology. So leveraging technology today is very, very helpful with TRID. And we're not talking about a lot of timing on the disclosures today, but technology helps with that as well. So it's really important to investigate the tools that are out there and available to you, the tools that you may already have within your organization. Typically, we see rules being built into the system, tasks, things that can be embedded into the system or coded into the system to alert users uh, for potential violations. And prior to sending the disclosures, like if you're running up against a deadline, the three-day requirement, you know, triggering those alerts automatically from the system, or if there's, you know, talking about the tolerance buckets that we've just talked about, if there's a change in the fees from the LE to the CD, having that trigger someone to, you know, an alert for someone to go in there and review it and determine what the issue is, resolve the issue before closing, you know, the technology can do so much for us. So keeping up on those pipeline reports, exception reports, or alerts that are coming through your system and having those things built into the system, if you can, are very, very important to help you uh, keep keep compliant with TRID. So I, I think everyone knows how important TRID is, but we hope that understanding some of the common issues and weaknesses that we see will help you strengthen your internal processes. 
So thank you very much for your time today. We hope that you found this information beneficial. And if you have any questions or would like to discuss how Richie May can help you, please feel free to contact us. And next time we'll dive into another one of our internal audit hot topics. Stay tuned for that and we'll see you next time. Thank you.